What if they don't talk, Mama? Um, them. What if they don't talk? Who don't talk and they talk? Mute. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Mama. Are you able to smell? What if the what if they are you able to smell? A little bit. Like it. This question is finished and what? No, doctor, this was yesterday night's last question. Uh, okay, okay. So let us discuss this while uh, other people join in. So yesterday I have sent this in the group also. Here, yes. So 52 year old man who was born in India, presents with episodic hemoptysis. His only history is tuberculosis as an adolescent. Chest X-ray shows rounded opacity in the right upper zone, surrounded by a rim of air. They say this is a correct answer is aspergilloma, not tuberculosis. But we were very sure it was tuberculosis, right? So this one is aspergilloma. We'll see the explanation as to why. 71 year old woman present with dyspnea hemoptysis for the past two weeks. Clinical examination reveals a loud first heart sound, diastolic murmur, new onset atrial fibrillation. It's mitral stenosis. Hemoptysis in mitral stenosis is thought to occur secondary to rupture of bronchial veins caused by raised left atrial pressure. You know, my auntie go bowling because to me pass the day. I have to say, I have to say, I have to say, I have to say, no, no, don't go near. You will get cough. Mama, 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 No problem. Come sit. 62 year old woman who is being investigated for renal impairment presents with hemoptysis. On examination, she has a flat nose. This flat nose is very typical uh, with hemoptysis and renal impairment is granulomatosis with polyangitis. In combination of pulmonary hemorrhage, hemoptysis, renal impairment, rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis, and flat or saddle nose due to collapse of the nasal septum is characteristic of granulomatosis with polyangitis. So, hemoptysis, let's see the explanation. Lung cancer, history of smoking will be there, symptoms of malignancy, weight loss, anorexia, pulmonary edema, there will be dyspnea, bibasal crackles, and S2 are more reliable signs of pulmonary edema yeah. tuberculosis fever night sweats anorexia and weight loss so in our case here did he have any fever no he had only a right upper zone uh, opacity surrounded by a rim of air he had episodic hemoptysis but he did not have any fever night sweats or anorexia or weight loss all these four symptoms should be present when we are diagnosing tuberculosis. Mama, Boy. you also get the first one wrong, right? It's okay. Pulmonary embolism. Pluritic chest pain, tachycardia and tachypnea. So tachycardia and tachypnea are very characteristic of pulmonary embolism. And pluritic chest pain will be there. Low respiratory tract infection, usually acute history of purulent cough will be there. When there is a lower respiratory tract infection, that is pneumonia. Bronchiectasis, usually long history of cough and daily purulent sputum production. Mitral stenosis, dyspnea, atrial fibrillation, malar flush on the cheeks, and mid diastolic murmur. It's characteristic of mitral stenosis. Aspergilloma, often a past history of tuberculosis is present. Hemoptysis may be severe. Chest x ray showed a rounded opacity. So, whenever there's a rounded opacity, we should not think in lines of Gaunt's focus uh, because that is primary TB. Uh, whenever there is a rounded opacity, we should also think about aspergilloma if there are no systemic symptoms. Granulomatosis with polyangitis. Upper respiratory tract uh, symptoms like epistaxis and sinusitis and nasal crusting. Lower respiratory tract symptoms like dyspnea and hemoptysis, glomerular nephritis and saddle nose deformity. Good pressure syndrome, hemoptysis, systemically unwell. Fever, nausea, and glomerulonephritis. Nausea. 
hemoptysis he is systemically unwell has fever nausea and glomerulonephritis dr shastri can anybody share x ray for to differentiate between the aspergilloma and the x tuberculosis we will uh, so uh, because you to know uh, if you are doing this question because x rays they are giving you no know, on an examination mm -hmm. so it is very really important yes we will say somebody has uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we will share it in the group tomorrow okay yeah yes, uh, doctor just send in just message in the ECGs, group what we have to share yeah ecgs and uh, x rays and uh, skin diseases pictures this is very important we have to read one day all these yeah so whenever any of you are reading that particular topic which you find there is some spotter uh, of skin diseases or anything uh, or x rays which you think uh, might be useful kindly take a screenshot and share it in the group doctors whenever you are reading antibiotics in pregnancy amoxicillin metronidazole nitrofurantoin trimethoprim coamoxiclav cefalexin erythromycin phenoxymethylpenicillin contact local microbiology services no antibiotics required in this scenario so all of these antibiotics can be given at some point in pregnancy what antibiotics are indicated in pregnancy for the following scenarios a mid stream urine sample returns for a woman at 24 weeks gestation she reports dysuria the results are growth of e coli amoxicillin sensitive coamoxiclav sensitive cefalexin sensitive trimethoprim resistant nitrofurantoin resistant at 24 weeks that is second trimester the patient has an epipen confirmed for penicillin allergy so you are not giving comexiclav you are not giving amoxicillin so next what is cephalexin 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 right a patient who has just recently had a positive urine pregnancy test her last menstrual period was 6 weeks ago approximately mm -hmm. and she develops a burning pain on passing urine with frequency symptomatic first trimester nitro 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 uh, pregnancy yes nitro pregnancy 40 forty, forty uh, term pregnancy term pregnancy woman attends her routine antenatal clinic there are no concerns throughout her pregnancy but her repeat urine dip today demonstrated nitrous positive she has no symptoms she reports to have a dodgy stomach a few times hour after having penicillin in the past a dodgy stomach is not uh, an allergy reaction to penicillin and uh, so she is at term so nitrofurantoin trimethoprim is anyways contraindicated in pregnancy nitrofurantoin is contraindicated in term so your options are amoxicillin and cefalexin so we will give amoxicillin right against against cefalexin okay cefalexin yes cefalexin again okay okay the first one is uh, Depend for confirmed penicillin allergy. This one is cefalexin is not correct. Contact local microbiology services. This patient should be treated with seven days of antibiotics for a confirmed UTI. The challenge here is that the patient had type one allergy to penicillin in the past, using requiring an epipen. So amoxicillin and comoxiclav would be contraindicated. There is a ten percent chance of cross reactivity between penicillin and first generation cefalosporin, including cefalexin. So this group of antibiotics should be avoided where there is severe allergy to penicillin. So yes, yes, there was some cross uh, reaction to penicillin uh, and cefalosporins. There is a cross cross reactivity is there. What are you doing? Please sit. Nice guidelines recommend that first line option is nitrofurantoin. Second line is either amoxicillin or cefalexin. Alternately, microbiology advice should be sought for appropriate antibiotic as this, as such as in this case here. The patient who has recently had a cross reaction between uh, cefalosporin and amoxicillin in, in first question. 
there is any clue in the question yes yes they have no no that that we are supposed to know they have given she had an allergy to penicillin that required an epipen that means it is a very severe allergy right not just to dodgy stuff and yes epipen epipen means that epinephrine required uh, epinephrine There is so no that's why there is a cross reaction between the third generation and the amoxicillin. There is a ten percent cross reaction, so we will not give cefalexin. Okay, now clear, Doctor Nadia. Thank you. Okay. So where were we here? Yeah. Ziyan, don't disturb the class. Go to here. Don't do that. A patient uh, who has recently had a positive pregnancy. This one was nitrofurantoin, right? We already did this. Uh, you could consider amoxicillin and cefalexin as second line options. Trimethoprim would be avoided at its lowest as it lowers the folic acid levels in the body, which could contribute to neural tube defects and developing in the developing fetus. If used in the first trimester, folic acid 5 mg should be given once a day. Should be given during the treatment. And this one is cefalexin. Cefalexin. Okay, good answering, Doctor uh, Atulla Khan. So this you have told correctly. Uh, she reports to have a dodgy stomach, so you are giving cefalexin. You would offer an immediate antibiotic in asymptomatic bacteria in pregnancy, which has been comfort, confirmed on a repeat urine dip. Nitrofurantoin should be avoided at term, as it may cause hemolysis in the newborn. Second line options include amoxicillin and cefalexin. And uh, since she had a dodgy stomach with penicillin, you are giving cefalexin. So UTI management we have already read yesterday. We will not repeat it today. A 70-year-old woman attends your clinic complaining of fatigue, excessive thirst, insomnia, muscle weakness, and constipation. Her examination on full count renal function test and liver function tests are normal. The other blood tests show the following results: calcium is 3.3 is high, phosphate is 0.65. is slow magnesium is 0.8 thyroid stimulating hormone is 3.5 is fine free thyroxine is 12 parathormone is 55 vitamin d is 200 nanograms per ml is also fine more than 30 should be normal old lady in the bony bony pain or so she has so she has fatigue no. insomnia Thirst is there, hypercalcemia, muscle weakness, constipation is there. So, what some, is the likely diagnosis they are asking? Thyroid disease looks like okay. <laughs> so there is no weight loss. So and other liver function, everything is fine. So it is not body metastasis. Primary hyperparathyroidism, secondary hyperparathyroidism, tertiary hyperparathyroidism, tuberculosis. Exclude bony metastasis and tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. Remaining these three. Primary, you know, secondary, tertiary. Secondary hyperparathyroidism is due to vitamin D deficiency. So vitamin D is fine here. Okay. Secondary D is secondary D is due to vitamin D yeah? mm. deficiency. Mm. Because I I am very weak in this one this. Uh, Yes, Especially doctor. this topic, okay. hyperparathyroidism, very weak. I am. Even I am telling confidently, but let me see the answer once we see. <laughs> I am thinking it is primary hyperparathyroidism. Secondary is to, due to vitamin D deficiency. Tertiary is because of kidney failure. Leading. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> no hyperparathyroidism, right? Yeah. Sometimes it will not be there. Sometimes parathyroid hormone level can be normal or high. No one thing I know is uh, for uh, hyperparathyroidism. Actually, you 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 have to know about the calcium and phosphate. Calcium there will be hypercalcemia and phosphate will be low. So these two we have clue. But I am not sure about vitamin D and parathyroid hormone. Vitamin D they are telling on enough it will be raised in some time inappropriately. It will be. Uh, normal. So here there is hypercalcemia. So uh, hypercalcemia is uh, suppose uh, means probably malignancy unless proved otherwise. Okay. So see calcium uh, is 3.3. So possible bone mass, right? But there there must be some weight loss history also. Usually they are giving with that. I don't know most of the time for the malignancy. Okay, we will see the answer, doctors. Then we will discuss. So it is primary hyperparathyroidism. 
Yes. yes. E- even though she is 70 years old, doctor, but any weight loss history is not here or any uh, signs or symptoms suggesting of any kind of cancer is not here. Her no, full blood yeah, count, yes. renal function test, liver function test, everything is normal. So, it is not pointing towards uh, malignancy doctor. The PTH level in primary hyperparathyroidism may be normal. This patient is presenting with symptoms of hypercalcemia, bones, stones, abdominal moans and psychic groans. Her blood test shows great calcium levels which confirms hypercalcemia. She has a normal parathyroid hormone. Normally, these would be decreased in presence of high calcium levels. The patient has primary hyperparathyroidism causing the calcium levels to be raised. Secondary is caused by another disease, usually a chronic kidney disease, leading to chronic hypocalcemia, therefore hyperparathyroidism. The high PTH level then increases the calcium levels to either normal or high levels. Okay, so initially there will be hypocalcemia, chronic hypocalcemia and then high PTH levels which is then secreted will increase the calcium levels to normal or high levels and this patient normal parathyroid hormone level rules out secondary hyperparathyroidism. So, in secondary hyperparathyroidism, you will be having very high parathormone levels. Her normal PTH levels rules out tertiary also. The PTH levels will be markedly raised in this patient had tertiary parathyroidism also. In secondary and tertiary, the PTH levels will be markedly raised. Although tuberculosis can cause hypercalcemia, there is no indication but because this patient has been abroad or come in contact with tuberculosis. Scenario also doesn't give any examination of blood finding which suggesting bony metastasis. <coughs> Primary hyperparathyroidism is most commonly cause of isolated hypercalcemia and is therefore most likely diagnosis in this patient. So they are giving explanation about parathyroidism. Primary hyperparathyroidism. Okay. So I have a table uh, somewhere. Or maybe wait, I will just Google it out so that we can read it here itself. So, doctor, the, the main difference between primary, secondary, and tertiary is the calcium level. In secondary and tertiary, it will be very high, isn't it? Wait, I will just uh, share one uh, table with you which has uh, calcium, PTH, vitamin D and phosphate levels in all the three types of parathyroidism. Give me a minute, I will share that screen. Okay. So, can you see the screen, doctors? This is a Google page. Yeah. Yes. Okay. See, we have a lab comparison. Where did it go? Yeah, we have a lab comparison here, hyperparathyroidism, calcium levels, parathormone levels, vitamin D levels and phosphate levels. So, whereas in secondary hyperthyroidism, we'll start from secondary, huh? Secondary hyperparathyroidism, the calcium levels can be low or normal, whereas parathormone level is high, vitamin D level is low, phosphate level is high or low. Tertiary, all the three are high, except for vitamin D. Calcium is high, PTH is high, phosphate is high, whereas vitamin D is low. Primary, calcium is high. Since calcium is high, P- PTH is high. Actually, PTH is high. That will cause increased calcium. And a negative feedback will cause decreased PTH again. So, PTH can be high or normal. And when PTH is acting on the renal tubules, it will cause calcium absorption and phosphate excretion. So, phosphate will be low in primary hyperparathyroidism. So, high calcium, low phosphate and high vitamin D is primary. Secondary is low calcium, low phosphate, low or normal phosphate, low vitamin D, only PTH will be high. In tertiary, all three will be high except for vitamin D. Tertiary is easy. (laughs) 
okay so uh, i think tomorrow again uh, the table i have shared in the group you can go through that and i will just share you the other screen now okay so primary hyperparathyroidism primary hyperparathyroidism is caused by excess secretion of pth resulting in hypercalcemia so initial problem here is there is excess pth secretion leading to hypercalcemia and hypophosphatemia this most common cause of hypercalcemia in outpatients and is often diagnosed following an incidental finding of an elevated serum calcium concentration 85% of case of parathyroid adenoma is responsible for primary hyperparathyroidism so 85% solitary adenoma 10% hyperplasia 4% multiple adenoma and 1% is carcinoma around 80% of patients are asymptomatic and are diagnosed on routine blood tests the symptomatic features of primary hyperparathyroidism may be remembered by the mnemonic bone stones abnormal groans and moans polydipsia polyuria depression anorexia nausea constipation peptic ulceration because of hypercalcemia pancreatitis because of hypercalcemia yesterday we were reading one more question right hypercalcemia leads to pancreatitis bone pain and fractures renal stones hypertension associations hypertension and multiple endocrine neoplasia men1 and men2 investigations bloods raised calcium low phosphate pth may be raised this is for primary so calcium is raised phosphate is low pth may be raised or inappropriately given in the raised calcium uh, given the raised calcium is normal or inappropriately given the raised calcium is normal okay or inappropriately it can be normal also uh, pth is raised or normal yeah so kya hai zia nahi chahiye mujhe technician system may be subtraction scan technician may be subtraction scan is investigation x ray findings pepper pot skull osteitis fibrosa cystica treatment zian mat do kabir ko bato the definitive management is total parathyroidectomy conservative management may be offered if calcium level is less than 0.025 millimoles per liter above the upper limit of normal so this is one thing we have to understand carefully is that you can give conservative management in hypercalcemia if the calcium level is less than 0.25 millimoles per liter above the upper limit of normal so what is the upper limit of normal we are here having here no 2.1 to 2.6 and 0.25 right where is yes. it where did it go yeah 0.25 millimoles means till point 2.2.85 right we can remember that so till 2.85 millimoles per liter of calcium you can give conservative management that is only hydration and the patient is more than 50 years old and there is no evidence of end organ damage okay in these three scenarios conservative management is there that is hydration patients not suitable for surgery may be treated with sinacalcet a calcium mimetic a calcium mimetic mimics the action of calcium on tissues by allosteric activation of the calcium sensing list receptor so people uh, other people they should be advised surgery and those not suitable for surgery will require sinacalcet so these are typical x rays which we can see bilateral hand radiographs in a middle aged woman demonstrating generalized osteopenia yes because you can see the trabecular network in the bones erosion of the terminal phalangeal tufts acro osteolysis here there is erosion of the terminal phalangeal tufts and subperiosteal resorption of bone particularly on the radial aspect of the second and third phalanges here subperiosteal resorption of the bones okay these changes are consistent with diagnosis of hyperparathyroidism there is one more see here subperiosteal resorption of the terminal phalangeal tufts erosion and again there is resorption here in the middle phalanges and pepper pot skull next question a 27 year woman who is uh, 39 plus 4 weeks pregnant presents with gp surgery with stinging passing urine stinging on passing urine she has no vaginal bleeding or discharge and reports no contractions she has 
no known drug allergies. Unilaryalysis is positive for nitrate. She has 3 plus leukocytes. Diagnosis of UTI is suspected. What is the most appropriate next step in primary care? She is fine. No vaginal bleeding. Only stinging on passing urine. Arrange a urine culture. Treat with a 7 day course of oral cephalexin. Repeat the urine culture 7 days after antibiotics have completed as a test of cure. Looks right, right? Arrange urine culture, treat with 7 day oral cephalexin. No need to repeat. No, this is wrong. You have to repeat as a test of cure. Arrange urine culture, treat 7 day course of oral nitrogen. Nitrogen should not be given in the last trimester, right? Again, near pregnancy, near term, okay, not okay. given. No. Test of cure needed in asymptomatic pregnant lady. Test of cure in asymptomatic. She is symptomatic. No need. Uh, this is something I remember. No, test of cure is for the both is symptomatic and asymptomatic. No, 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 no. This is the main difference, but we will see. We okay, will see. okay, doctor. We will just confirm now. Okay? okay. So, first one okay. or second one you are thinking, right? So, arrange for urine thinking, culture uh, no, to await no. the results before commencing treatment it is absolutely wrong. You have to give immediately antibiotic empirical. So, first answer is correct. Test of cure is required. Nitrofurantin should be avoided at term. Reduce it to immediately hemolysis. Uh, here, all women with suspected UTI should send a urine culture and sensitivity before antibiotics are started. Seven days after treatment has completed as a test of cure. So, all pregnant women, there should be a test of cure. In urinary tract infection is suspect. If urinary tract infection is suspected, treatment should be commenced before awaiting culture results. Local antibiotic prescribing guidelines should be followed. However, it's important to note that nitrofurantin should be avoided at term owing to risk of neonatal hemolysis and therefore cephalexin is a safer alternative. Recommend seven days course of antibiotic in pregnancy. Can you come down, down clear a little now? bit, doctor? Go to the previous one. Here. Down? Yeah, because yeah. Down, down for explanation. Yeah. Here, here, I here is the pregnant woman. Right? See, in pregnant here. woman. Here is nothing written this stuff. Given. What I was remembering, see, in asymptomatic, they wrote treatment, this stuff given needed. But in asymptomatic, they didn't wrote. They so, did not write. I don't know. They did not write, doctor, but it will be required. In pregnant woman, it will be required. So, okay, because of this point, no, because it was not written, so no problem, that's doctor. why I was Yes, in pregnant woman, woman, if she is symptomatic or non symptomatic, we have to okay. start the treatment. So, okay. that's why it is a test of cure. Yeah, okay. But, but uh, what, why I am telling? Because of this, uh, because it was not written with symptomatic there, so why? So, it is clear now, need in both. No problem, okay. doctor. You delete the older uh, conception. Uh, in your mind and just no, not conception, not because I I couldn't understand because I was thinking it is not written in the symptomatic so pregnant in, lady, in so both, maybe not needed. No, that is why. No, no, no. In both it is required because if there is any residual infection, if there is any okay, please please mute that. <laughs> please mute that. If there is any residual infection, you will have to. Uh, give them proper antibiotic or as per the okay. culture sensitivity. You know when uh, you are sending for culture and uh, culture might take two days, three days result. So you have given an empirical antibiotic for pregnancy patient. So once uh, the result of culture will come, you will not uh, change the antibiotic, right? You will continue yes. what empirical you have given. So that is why a test of cure would be required to see if the antibiotic you have prescribed did actually curtail the infection or still there is some smallling infection is there. So that's why a test of cure will be required for pregnant women as well as uh, whether symptomatic or asymptomatic. Okay, got it. Now got it. A six month old baby who was born in Bangladesh brought to surgery. Around one week ago he started started with chorizal symptoms. His mother reports he has not been feeling well for the past two days and uh, not been feeding well uh, and uh, has started to vomit today. Her main concern is cough, which occurs in bouts and is very severe and uh, we often turns red. Looks like pertussis. No inspiratory, yeah. inspiratory noises are noted. No clinical examination Examination reveals aparexial child with clear chest. What is the most likely diagnosis? Pertussis. Aparexial and a clear chest. Bronchiolitis, mycoplasma, pertussis, febrile pneumonia syndrome, afebrile pneumonia syndrome or tuberculosis. Continuous coughing with vomiting in between that is a point towards pertussis. Pertussis, yes. Right? 
so again there is they have given no inspiratory or expiratory noises so if there were some inspiratory or expiratory noises we would think in lines of rao the correct answer is doctor i will have to mute you the correct answer is pertussis pertussis also known as whooping cough is highly contagious respiratory tract infection caused by the bacterium bordetella pertussis the symptoms described in the question uh, stem are characteristic of this condition initial phase presents with coryzal symptoms progressive to severe bouts of coughing then that can cause a child to turn red even vomit this is followed by an inspiratory whoof sound that although it may not always be present especially in infants furthermore pertussis should be suspected in unimmunized children or those from countries with poor vaccination coverage like bangladesh okay and here is whooping cough whooping cough is an infectious disease caused by gram negative bacterium bordetella pertussis typically presents in children there are around 1000 cases are reported each year in the uk it sometimes called as cough of 100 days infants are routinely immunized at 2 3 4 and 3 to 5 years so 2 3 4 as a 6 in 1 vaccine and 3 to 5 years as a 4 in 1 vaccine preschool vaccine newborn infants are particularly vulnerable which is why vaccination campaign for pregnant women has been introduced so whenever you are vaccinating a pregnant woman it is not to protect the pregnant woman but for the newborn infant neither infection nor immunization results in lifelong protection hence adolescents and adults may develop whooping cough despite of having their routine immunizations features scattered face symptoms are similar to viral respiratory tract infection lasting around 1 to 2 weeks paroxysmal phase the cough increases in severity coughing bouts are usually worse at night and after feeding and may be en- ended by vomiting and associated central cyanosis can be present inspiratory whoof all not always present caused by forced inspiration against the close quarters infants may have spells of apnea persistent coughing may cause subconjunctival hemorrhages or even anoxia leading to a syncope and seizures last between 2 to 8 weeks convalescent phase the cough subsides over weeks or two months so the diagnostic criteria is whooping cough should be suspected if a person has an acute cough that has lasted for 14 days or more without any apparent cause and ha- has one of the following features a paroxysmal cough inspiratory whoof post tussive vomiting and diagnosed apneic attack in young infants diagnosis per nasal swab for bordetella pertussis may take several days or weeks to come back pcr and serology are now increasingly used as the availability has become more widespread management infants under 6 months suspected pertussis admitted so if their patient is under 6 months they should be admitted in uk pertussis is notifiable oral macrolide like clarithromycin azithromycin erythromycin is indicated if the onset of cough is within the previous 21 days to eradicate the organism and reduce the spread So, if the patient comes to you within 21 days, then you give clarithromycin, azithromycin, or erythromycin. Household contact should be offered. Antibiotic prophylaxis. Antibiotic therapy has not shown to alter the course of the illness. School exclusion only it will reduce the spread of the organism. It will not alter the course of the illness. School exclusion 48 hours after commencing antibiotics or 21 days from onset of symptoms if no antibiotics. complications subconjunctival hemorrhages because of the continuous coughing pneumonia bronchiectasis and seizures seizures also and bronchiectasis vaccination of pregnant women uh, the vaccination program was introduced in 2012 for pregnant women and when should the vaccine be given the vaccine is thought to be of more than 90% effective in preventing newborns from whooping whooping cough It was, however, decided in 2014 to extend the whooping cough vaccination program for pregnant women. This decision was taken as was a great deal of uncertainty about the timing of future outbreaks. Women who are between 16 to 32 weeks pregnant will be offered the vaccine. What happened to this? Can I do it? No, no. The net is closed. Sure. नहीं जा रहा ना आगे फिर आई डू इट नो आई आई विल एंड इट तो मैं नहीं आता मत टच करो मेरे टैब यार 
Okay, okay. something's wrong. You're not pressing anything, Mama. I was pressing that. Okay, let me share. What happened? Oh, one out of 16 questions. Okay, doctors, can we end it here today? Uh, actually, I have a, a symposium now. 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock. So we'll end our class today here, and tomorrow we will do some extra time also. Okay, doctors. Mama, sorry, eleven o'clock. Tomorrow, okay. Tomorrow, nine, ten o'clock. Ten o'clock. Yeah, uh, today no matter. I don't like be missing it because I have from five to twelve p.m. Oh. Oh, I'll be missing it really. Okay. जुनू लग जाएगी तुम्हें जुनू नो प्रॉब्लम It's okay. I'm trying to blow it. Don't do. Why, Why Mama?